forget diabetes now, you know? Metformin, yeah, it's for diabetes, but it's also against aging. And the proof of that is that people without diabetes take metformin and get a 50% decrease in a terrible, you know, a, a, a disease that had terrible outcomes because this is what metformin is doing, not only metabolism. I'm just not convinced at this point, based on the research, that we should be going against the guidelines and just prescribing metformin to virtually everyone um, to treat aging, because I, I don't think that the evidence is there yet, and hopefully the TAME trial will answer that. Hello, everybody. My name is Nikola Chernovsky, and today we will discuss a very important subject in the rejuvenation and longevity uh, uh, area in general. And that is uh, not only the use of uh, metformin uh, for longevity, but also uh, the same trial that can uh, possibly test uh, the, the effects of uh, metformin uh, in longevity. So to discuss with us, uh, we have two uh, people very uh, known in, the, in this field. Uh, it's here, Dr. Uh, Nir, Barzilai uh, is president of the Academy of Health and Lifespan Research. And it's with us also uh, Dr. Brad Stanfield. Uh, Brad uh, has a um, YouTube channel with uh, 250,000 uh, subscribers. And uh, he is a, a primary care physician in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. So uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, Dr. Barzilai. Uh, I mean, first, could you please give, give us a, a image of how the team trial is, uh, is, is going, the preparations, what, what's the state of funding and in order we have an update of the situation you know i i've been i've been asked uh, i i've been asked like that before and so i became clever about answering T tame had many initiations that and and, and that, that delayed it substantially mainly covid by the way too bad because metformin is a great uh, drug for covid but mainly uh, covid but there were um, funders who came and go. So um, I started uh, using the answer, we'll get started by December, okay? TAME will be launched by December. Now, please notice, I didn't say which year, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm remaining it open, but I think that we would like um, to start as soon, we, and, and we might start with um, not the full study, but maybe four centers. Um, you, you know, it's a problem to start a study before, to recruit people to a full study before the whole study is funded. So we have money to start the fund, the study now, but not to end it uh, at this minute. And I hope it'll change dramatically in the next few weeks or months. The same trial uh, is, uh, will cost uh, several uh, million do dollars. In fact, uh, around, I think, 60 million dollars or something like this. Let, let, let me just get back. You know, you started whether it's funded or not, but why are we doing the TAME trial? What, what's the reason we're doing TAME? Uh, the studies on metformin has been done. You, you know, the uh, the quality of the evidence can be A to D. Uh, 70 papers that the evidence is A and B, that metformin is significantly doing something, right? Um, it's preventing uh, cardiovascular diseases, it prevented uh, cancers, it's preventing um, dementia, it's preventing kidney failure, it's preventing liver failure. Okay, all those studies has been done, they have very good quality. Why are we doing TAME? We're doing TAME for only one reason. Only one reason. Metformin is a tool to demonstrate to the FDA that aging can be targeted, okay? That's the only reason. When we talk with the FDA, we don't talk about metformin. They know everything that we have to do in metformin. TAME is designed to ask, is one drug going to delay a cluster 
of age-related diseases and mortality. Is taking metformin going to prevent, you get the point for each one of that, heart disease, cancer, cognitive decline, and mortality. Okay, this is a construct. And if it does, it means for us that you interfere with aging. Okay, because that's where we are coming from. Metformin targets all the hallmarks of aging. So we want to show this drug will prevent aging because aging is what uh, causes the diseases. Okay, it drives the diseases. So if we interfere with aging, we're going to affect not one, not two, and three diseases together. So it's not it's not that we're curious to know what's the result. We, we plan TAME and the dose of metformin and the ages of people because we knew that it's going to be successful, but it's for the FDA to understand that aging itself is a target. You said, you said it costs $60 million. You know, if you want to do, if you want now to show that metformin prevents heart disease, it's almost a billion dollar study. So it's actually much cheaper to do a TAME trial for pharmaceuticals who want to know if it targets the right, the biology, the biology of aging. Yeah, but uh, the reason we are uh, doing this debate is precisely because this argumentation you you are make you are making uh, we we are uh, listening to this for years and we uh, I mean we in the rejuvenation field in general we generally agree with that but the fact is that uh, the study didn't start it so. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that it's useful to dig in what can be the counter arguments because there is something stopping this uh, uh, trial uh, to be carried out. So uh, uh, I before this conversation, I was watching uh, one of one of the videos that Brad uh, made uh, regarding. Uh, metforming. And one thing that uh, Brad uh, said in the video, Brad, correct me if I am wrong, but uh, you said that the, the, the lifespan increase uh, in in the trials with metfor metforming uh, wasn't uh, precisely uh, a study very uh, compelling. I think it's important to um, to clarify a couple of things. So the clinical guidelines um, absolutely recommend that we use metformin for type two diabetics and pre diabetics, um, but you know the, the guidelines don't suggest that we should be using metformin for non diabetics, um, and 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 that's because we don't have evidence within that age uh, within that um, population group that metformin will offer benefits for you know cancer, cardiovascular disease, all cause mortality. Um, you know, and, and one of the, the famous trials of that was the Diabetes Prevention Program uh, study that was published in 2021 that involved just over 3,000 people. Uh, that was a randomized controlled trial. And over a 21-year period, there was no difference w between the placebo group versus metformin in all-cause mortality and cancer and cardiovascular disease. So, you know, I, I'm not about to start prescribing metformin to my non-diabetic patients um, until we've got evidence within that um, within that patient population. But for my pre-diabetics and type 2 diabetic patients, you know, every day I'm prescribing metformin for them. So uh, I think it's just important to, to clarify that. And, and that's why I fully support what Nira is trying to do, that if we can, you know, use uh, studies such as the TAME study to actually show that, yes, there is a, a mortality benefit for non-diabetic patients, I think I think that's wonderful. So I, I want to I just uh, comment on that. There, First of all, there are three clinical studies that showed that metformin uh, decreased mortality in the diabetes patients versus control, right? Versus other drugs. Yeah. One was 22% overall mortality, one was 36% uh, overall mortality, and one was 50% mortality. So the evidence that metformin uh, affect mortality is clear, but I also want to tell you, if you agree that metformin prevents heart disease or, or dementia or any one of those other things, you know that's that's what happens to aging. So if you have less of those diseases, you live longer. I'm not I'm not saying, you know, I think it's the same mechanism kind. 
But I, I want to say something because this is such a common mistake. The study on the DPP OS that you said. So the DPP was a study, was uh, planned as a five-year study to show if metformin uh, intervention with exercise and, um, and diet versus placebo will prevent diabetes. The study was so successful because lifestyle intervention and metformin decrease the onset of diabetes by so much that it was finished in four years, okay? Okay, so the study was 1990, I don't remember, five to 1999, okay? <laughs> now you're saying it ended in 21. No, there was a follow-up, okay? There was a follow-up that lasted for 20 years. But after four years, some of the patients who were not on metformin start taking metformin. Some of the people who were metformin stop metformin. There are people who started exercising or dieting. So the DPP kind of got into their head, is there a memory if you were on metformin? But how could there be a memory if all of a sudden you have people who totally cross groups? So to say this is a clinical study, it was not a clinical study after 1999. The evidence there is zero, is <laughs> really zero. It's actually, it's really um, annoying even to hear that, that this study went on and, and everybody thinks it's a clinical studies when it's not a clinical study, okay? So we, we have to know. There's no evidence for that because this is stopped being a clinical study. As long as it was clinical study, it was great. I just read the study before coming on to this. It says that, so the, the metformin group, yes, they were unblinded, at, but they continued the metformin. It wasn't the other groups that then started metformin. The other group started the lifestyle intervention, but you still had the group randomized to the metformin who were continuing to take the metformin. No, look at, look at the supplements. They crossed over, okay? They crossed over. And, and there was even not, not a good uh, follow-up on them. You, you didn't do the adherence anymore. Uh, there are other drugs that started interfering, right? So after 99, all of a sudden, at some point, everybody started on statins and other things. It wasn't a clinical study. <laughs> okay, so you didn't do a clinical study. If it's clinical study, everybody stays in the group. It wasn't, absolutely not. My overall point there is that I don't think there's enough evidence for non-diabetics to be taking metformin. I agree on that, but this is, so this is a very different concept. And I tell you what divides us, Brett. You think, I think of diabetes as an age-related disease. I think the risk for diabetes, to get diabetes, the major risk is aging, okay? It's much more than obesity, okay? Or, or something like that. And so for me, it's all about aging, what metformin is doing. By the way, metformin, metformin was started as an aging drug. In the 1920s, the 1950s, the extracts of the French lilac were used to prevent flu, to treat arthritis, lots of things like that. And it was a magic drug, right? We see what happened with COVID. It's a magic drug. But then people notice that it lowers glucose in people with diabetes. So it was hijacked. Okay, for me, that's great. And metformin is a good, good anti-diabetic drugs, but the, the reason that it affects a mortality has nothing to do with the diabetes. Look. We, we, we don't know that for certain though. Like the, the, the human studies that have showed a mortality benefit with metformin are in diabetic patients. Right, but I'm saying that the, when you talk about mortality, you talk about aging. So, okay, so... For example, the study from the UK that showed that people on diabetes with metformin and without metformin, the, 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 sorry, people with metformin versus other drugs, versus sulfonylurea, actually, they decrease mortality by 50%, okay? So you would say, okay, so maybe it has to do with diabetes. So maybe metformin achieved better control. No, it achieved worse control. So you say, well, maybe the people in metformin were, were leaner. No, they were actually heavier. Obesity on itself is a risk for, uh, for accelerated aging. So you can, you can get stuck on the fact that it's important if it's diabetic or not, 
but I don't think it's even relevant a uh, discussion. Of course, it's it. Of course, it's doing from an aging perspective. It's doing everything for everyone. And I'll tell you, there's plenty of study, and those are among the seventy study that I have. Plenty of study in non-diabetics. You, you know, there's cognitive. There are two studies that were looking at cognitive decline at people who had MCI, and um, and they were non-diabetic, and and they were. And metformin delayed cognitive decline in non-diabetic patients. There's plenty of other studies in the last years that are in non-diabetic. I would say also there are other drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors that were designed for diabetes. This is part of why it's so important. It's designed for diabetes, but it affects other diseases. Okay, so SGLT2 was designed for diabetes. All of a sudden, it prevents kidney disease and it prevents heart disease. GLP-1 was designed for diabetes. All of a sudden it's used for obesity. In obesity, guess what? It prevents Parkinson. It prevents a, a, a cardiovascular disease. It has other things that's coming out because those drugs are gerotherapeutics. They target the biology of aging and whether somebody has diabetes or not. When you have diabetes, it just means you're older biologically. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work on people who don't have diabetes. I think it's important not to um, not to oversimplify things, though, Nia, because if if a if a study has been done in type two diabetic patients, then we know what that drug will do in that type two diabetic population. But I don't think we yet know the exact um, effects that metformin will have on non diabetic patients. A, a lot of the studies have been observational studies comparing you know, type 2 diabetics who are taking metformin versus non-diabetics, but that's still an observational study. And, I, you know, if if there was such strong evidence for metformin in non-diabetic patients, then the guidelines would reflect that and it, it would be part of clinical practice. And and I don't think you'd need to do the, the TAME trial because we would have all the evidence that we need. My overall point is that I, I don't think that non-diabetics should, should be prescribed or taking metformin. Um, because I think there's still a lack of evidence, and hence why I'm supportive of the TAME study. Because if we can see that, yes, in non-diabetic patients, there are you know mortality benefits, there's cardiovascular disease benefits, there's cancer benefits, wonderful. But I, I yeah, I, given that we don't have that robust evidence yet, it's not part of the clinical guidelines. There are two studies that um, you, you, you talked about, but you avoided two studies with evidence that's A, both are 1A, that is the diabetes prevention trial that you mentioned. <laughs> you went to the follow-up period, but in this study, non-diabetic patients were treated with metformin for over four years, and it prevented diabetes and, for, and very other outcomes. So it's not that metformin hasn't been studied clinically in people without diabetes. So the, the guidelines reflect that now. For people with high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, like the pre-diabetics, for example, they are, it's suggested that they should be prescribed metformin, and that's what I do in my clinical practice. But for non-high-risk people, so people who don't have you know, high fasting blood sugar levels, for so people who aren't obese, that's the population that I'm talking about, that I think there's still a lack of evidence. Because if there was a, you know, a strong case to be made at, at the current state, then the guidelines would reflect it and it, we would just be prescribing metformin to, to virtually everyone. But we don't because, again, we, we need studies like the TAME trial. Okay, we, we, all, we all agree that we need the TAME trial, but but my worry is not about not diabetics. But but that, that, that's the point, uh, Nir. Uh, you both agree uh, that TAME trial needs to be done. But uh, you, Nir, you are very used to one side of the of the arguments, I mean, uh, I I think maybe bread uh, can help you to understand uh, how to overcome some hurdles because I think bread has a perspective that maybe many people in the regulatory environment have, and many people in investors or people who could. Uh, fund the TAME trial have, and maybe they don't tell you uh, explicitly. For example, the state of the United States, for example, didn't uh, accept it to, to fund uh TAME trial completely, but they could do it. Why uh, there is so much resistance 
to, 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 you know, to the complete funding of this trial? The fact that we, we weren't funded is because it's a big study to fund. We have a lot of the money now. The enthusiasm didn't go. It's not that metformin lost appeal or that the FDA lost appeal. It's clear for people that metformin has effects that are not in diabetic. And by the way, although metformin corrects glucose of diabetic, it doesn't decrease glucose in non-diabetic patient. It's not a hypoglycemic agent. It's an anti-hyperglycemic agent. It improves insulin sensitivity in the liver. So even the FDA never raised the fact, what about you doing something in non-diabetic? You know, metformin, uh, I'll give you another example that you're totally missing. And that's the fact that in New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet in the last year, metformin was used in people who got, who got uh, COVID, non-diabetic people. And people who were on metformin had half the hospitalization, half of the uh, mortality, and 70% less long COVID. Those were non-diabetic people. Why did it work? Because metformin works on the hallmark of aging. It works on immunology, not only on metabolism. That's why it was given against flu and malaria in the 1920s and 1950s. There are plenty of studies in non-diabetic that have effects, okay, uh, this wasn't a concern of the FDA. And, and when you're saying, you know, why they're not funded, it's because, you know, we, we, had, we had somebody who was going to fund everything and then something happened to him. And then we were going to fund something else and all, all of a sudden COVID happened. Now we have a, about 40% of the funding and we're trying to get the rest of the funding. And I think we know how to get the rest of the funding and I hope it'll happen soon. But this has nothing to do with skepticism of people. This is our failure to get funding to start the trial. That's all. So I was just having a look at what up to date was saying about metformin with, with COVID. So, and I'm just reading word for word what they've said. The available data has not shown them metformin to be effective in reducing the risk um, to severe progression in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. As an example, in one randomized controlled trial of over 400 unvaccinated, non-hospitalized patients um, with, COVID, with a recent COVID infection, um, there was no improvement in viral clearance, clinical improvement, or time to hospitalization or death in those who received extended release metformin. The study was stopped early for futility. In another randomized controlled trial of over 1,000 non-hospitalized symptomatic patients with COVID-19, uh, metformin was not associated with the decreased risk of hypoxemia and ED visit, hospitalization, or death. Um, although this study demonstrated lower incidence of post-COVID-19 symptoms, such as long COVID, with metformin compared to placebo. Um, but we do not use metformin for the treatment of acute uh, COVID-19 solely for this reason of reducing incidence of post-COVID infection. So, um, yeah, that's what the guidelines say. And I, I've, I've not used metformin to treat COVID-19 before. So um, there are nine other papers around the world during COVID to show that people on metformin had 50% re 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 less hospitalization and death. And that's why the clinical study started. But yeah, I, I agree. I agree that not everybody does metformin, but I'm telling you in New York, <laughs> people with COVID, they get metformin before they take the other terrible drugs. Okay, because the the results are quite substantial. Before this 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 uh, conversation, I read an article by Aubrey de Grey that he wrote uh, several years ago, in fact, and he discussed cost effectiveness of of this trial. So uh, now, after everything we we discuss it, uh, do you do you think that? Uh, it's cost effective, you know, uh, to spend this, uh, this uh, funds on this same trial. Metformin is a very cheap medication. And, um, you know, if, if, it, if it was true that metformin um, can improve, you know, lifespan by 10%, again, for non-diabetics, we, we know what's going to happen with type 2 diabetics, um, then absolutely. And particularly if it's only, I, I don't know the exact costs of the TAME trial, but um, you know, it's going to be significantly less compared to a new medication uh, that, that needs all of the research. So I think absolutely. And again, I'm fully supportive of the TAME study. I've, I've, I've mentioned this multiple times now. I want it to be funded and I want it to be done. My, my overall point is that until we've got 
um, that research, I don't think we should be going against the clinical guidelines and prescribing metformin for non-diabetics. That's my overall point. The question for me is, if the FDA says that aging can be targeted, and so pharmaceuticals are developing more drugs and better drugs to target aging, would it be, as you say, cost-effective? Because this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to change the FDA. Now, if you're asking, is metformin cost-effective? I will uh, point you to a, a paper in Nature Aging that was written by Andrew Scott. He's a professor of economy in London Business School. And he basically calculates what it means to, you know, I have centenarians who not only are living longer, they're living healthier, not only they're living healthier, they are sick very little at the end of their, their life. In fact, the CDC showed that um, the medical cost in people over the age of 100 is third of those that in, in 70. So there's what we started call a longevity dividend. And Andrew Scott wrote a paper and the paper, he said, first of all, you're crazy. You're saying the medical cost in the last two years of life. Okay, but those people are not in the hospital. So what are they doing? They are traveling, they are shopping, they are buying houses for their kids. So there is a there is an economical value of being healthy, okay, that we don't take into two aspects. With the second part of this study, he talks about TAME and he says, according to my calculation, okay, now remember TAME, 1500 will be on metformin and 1500 will be in placebo. But he calculates that the economical value of the 1500 people on metformin is a one and a half million, is $150 million for a study that costs third of that. Okay. So you can say that only in the study there's a cost effectiveness. But as Brett said, if we implement, if this if this comes in, this is the cheapest drug in the market, you can expect basically two years on average of extension of, of health span, maybe, maybe lifespan. This is huge value for the individual and for the economy. But uh, there is no patent linked to metformin. Maybe uh, private investors are, are not interested because there is no uh, patent uh, linked. And maybe uh, the, the, the state uh, doesn't uh, um, fund it as well because precisely you said you want to change FDA. So maybe there are uh, political resistance. Uh, these are theories. Uh, I, I, you don't think it's something like that, the, the reason. No, look, when we went to the FDA, who went to the FDA scientists? We said, we, we are not representing pharmaceutical. Don't be, don't be, you know, we, we're taking a drug, okay? And we're trying to show you that we can repurpose the drug for another purpose. And we are not embedded with any company, okay? Now you're right. If, if there are other drugs, and you know, if somebody has a better drug, <laughs> they can go to the FDA, take our template and maybe do the study itself. We're, you know, investors are not the people who will give us the money, okay? The people who will give us the money are big organization or billionaires. Th those are the people who, who will give us the money. And they were there, you, you know, one of them lost his money, <laughs> you know, some others have promised more and they're giving less now. This is, this is just our, fundraising post covid that has been a uh, uh, delayed and we're trying to get over that brad uh you are you have a youtube channel uh very successful especially for the area of rejuvenation or longevity that is not easy to do it and i was thinking if uh if there is no opposition from the regulators and the rejuvenation or longevity field is uh, supporting this this uh, trial realization. Do you think it, it would be possible for uh, Dr. Nir uh, Barzilai to make a crowdfunding campaign? I mean, you are you have your experience in YouTube with uh, 250,000 subscribers. So uh, do you think if uh, 
near uh you know headed a a crowdfunding campaign not for you know billionaires to to fund it but the general public do you think uh, it would be re relatively possible so yeah i've got a bit of experience with this because i've recently funded um my rapamycin and exercise clinical study through my youtube channel but you know that that fundraising effort took about three years so um and and we were asking for a lot less money compared to what the the tame trial will need so um i, I think crowdfunding from you know youtube ca it, it is great but it's only going to go so far i think um with the type of numbers that are needed to fund the tame trial i unfortunately don't think it's going to make a huge dent i don't think my channel will make a huge dent okay what what do you think uh near uh a crowdfunding campaign would you we actually have, have looked at this uh, option, but you know, sometimes the crowdfunding um, is better when you have a commercial endpoint, right? Uh, I mean, it, it's, I guess it wasn't with you, Brad, but um, to raise this kind of money, we're, we're looking at it actually, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I think they're probably going to be soon big news <laughs> that are not crowdfunding. But I, I think it's an interesting way. A crowdfunding is actually, I, I find that there are more people in the aging that are responding to that, you know, than maybe to other diseases. So I, I'm not against the, the crowdfunding idea. I think it gave, I think Breads is a great example of money that could be a very enlightening to us. I, I want to I want to just say I I started telling Brad about a, a repurposing of metformin to non diabetics. So one is COVID, and by the way, in my area, everybody that gets COVID, not I'm not prescribing any metformin to anyone, but those who get COVID now in New York, they are they are put on metformin. <laughs> so diabetes has nothing to do with it. They're you know mostly not diabe diabetic, but remember metformin has the first repurposing was for obesity. It's not a great drug for obesity, but people on metformin lose between five and 10 pounds. So people were happy with that. Second is PCOS. Okay, women with PCOS for insulin resistant there, that's the first drug of choice. So there's so many millions that are getting metform <laughs> metformin with results that are not diabetic that I think- Yeah, and, and the clinical guidelines reflect that. Yeah, so I, I agree with you, you know, P, uh, patients that I see with PCOS at the clinic, I prescribe the metformin as per the clinical guidelines. My overall point is that, and I keep harping back on this, the guidelines suggest for pre-diabetics, we should be using metformin. For type 2 diabetics, we should be using metformin. For PCOS, we should be using metformin. There's a bunch of um, indications where, yes, metformin's got great evidence. I'm just not convinced at this point, based on the research, that we should be going against the guidelines and just prescribing metformin to virtually everyone um, to treat aging, because I don't think that the evidence is there yet. And hopefully the TAME trial will answer that. When you said the guidelines, they're not FDA uh, guidelines. FDA doesn't say that metformin is for prediabetes. And we try to get the FDA to uh, to to have prediabetes. And the FDA said, no, we're not going to do it. We said, why? They said, because... Um, if you think that it's important, then you should define, you know, diabetes is defined by hemoglobin A1C. If you think prediabetes is important, then define it by hemoglobin A1C of 5.8 and not of 6.5. Okay, so sometimes the politics is is in 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 the in 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 this regulation. Another thing that happens to us when we went to the FDA, we had also diabetes as one of the outcomes. And the FDA said, no, we don't want diabetes as one of the outcomes. You know, when we went to FDA, we said, we're going to, the, to do this study. We don't want to be at the end of the study and somebody at the FDA will say, you should have done something else. So this is our study. And the FDA came up and we have, you know, big uh, exchange. And they said, we'd like you to calculate uh, and take diabetes outcome out. And I was, I'm a diabetologist. I got upset. What do you have against diabetes as an outcome? So it's very interesting. The FDA thinks that diabetes, it's a chemical diagnosis. The complications happen 10 years later in 40% of the people. So diabetes is not outcome like if you have heart disease, if you have cancer, if you have dementia, okay? It's not the same outcome for them. So we came to the FDA with 2,800 people 
as the study and we had to adjust and now it's 3000 because diabetes is not one of our outcomes. So, so, and it's also Nicola for you, you say, you know, the regulation and who's against, those are kind of things that we're, we're dealing with, but this is past. The FDA has no concern with non-diabetes. They have no concern, you know, they, we have a green light <laughs> to do the study. We just don't have the money. So coming to that point near about the um, clinical guidelines. So I'm just reading the clinical guideline database, uptodate.com, which is one of the um, guideline databases I use in my clinical practice. And I, I'm just looking through their metabolic syndrome um, pathway. So it says drugs to prevent diabetes for select patients. Patients uh, who have persistent insulin resistance despite attempts at lifestyle changes may benefit from metformin. This is similar to recommendations for patients with prediabetes based on the prevention uh, diabetes prevention program, which we've talked about. Um, and consistent with guideline recommendations from the American Diabetes Association. So the, I, th I think that that's my point. If I try and boil it down to who are we actually giving metformin to, there's a, a lot of indications that we're already using metformin, as you and I both agree. I think that the biggest um, the, the, the biggest difference, I suppose, that we have in, in our opinion at this point is whether non-diabetics should be using metformin or not right now. And that's where I'm hoping that the TAME trial will will be able to answer that question. Because, it, I, I, yeah, if if an otherwise healthy person, if they're 60 and they see me at the clinic and there's no hint that they've got insulin resistance, they're otherwise well, you know, the guidelines would not suggest to put that patient on metformin and, and I wouldn't prescribe them metformin. But maybe the TAME trial will change that. I, I understand, Brett. And I, and I understand, I, look, I came, you know, I, I grew up like you, okay? I came from the diabetes field. But by the way, um, you know who described first the mechanism of aging on metformin in humans? What paper showed what metformin is doing? Well, I'll 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 save you. It was me. Okay, so people are coming and telling me, "Hey, metformin doesn't do what you're doing. It's doing something else." And I say, "Who's the author?" And they see it's me, and that's what that's true, and that's what I thought. But you are stuck in in diabetes. Your world is insulin resistant and stuff. And I, who thought that insulin resistance is the essential of aging, are, are now in another field, okay? And in my field, metformin, okay, it treats diabetes, it's very cool. But for us, metformin and the evidence we have from animals and from humans is that it targets the hallmarks of aging, okay? So you can talk as much as you want on your perspective, but my perspective is very different. It, yeah, it treats diabetes. If you tell me, if you tell me metformin will lower your glucose if you're not diabetic or something like that, okay, I, I would agree. But if I'm talking about one mechanism and you're talking about the other, there's that's why we we disagree. So I agree. There's not as many treatment. Uh, there's not out of the seventy study, uh, sixty three, I think are on people people with diabetes. That's how we started the field. But for me, the proof out there is that it has nothing to do, the metformin effect on aging have nothing to do if you have diabetes or not. Diabetes is just means that you're already older <laughs> biologically, okay? Because diabetes is an L type two diabetes is an age-related disease. Sorry, Dan, can, can I just respond to, to that, what, what you've just said? The, the reason why I, I, I divide this in my mind is, is not, it's not because I'm unable to shift my perspective. It's more trying to picture in my mind who I would be prescribing metformin to in the clinic and who I am already prescribing metformin to in the clinic. So like I said, not, not a day goes by when I'm not prescribing metformin in, in my clinic, but that that I, I, I make sure to follow the clinical guidelines. And the, the reason why I do that is because there's strong evidence, again, for PCOS, for weight loss, pre-diabetics, type 2 diabetics, my point is, should metformin be given to otherwise healthy people? And I think that's that's where I'm not convinced that there's enough evidence. Um, and, and that's where I'm hoping that the TAME trial will be able to answer. So again, I'm excited by the work that you're doing, and I, I fully support it. And once again, I hope that your TAME trial will be fully funded and and the results come come through. But as of right now, um, at, you know, outside of the, the conditions that we've already gone through and listed, I'm just not convinced that people should be taking metformin. People less than age of 50 shouldn't take metformin un unless, you know, unless maybe they're pre-diabetic or PCOS, right? Or, or COVID. I don't know. Okay. But 
you know, one of the things with aging, there's the antagonistic plot refer hypothesis of aging. Things that are good for you when you're young are not good for you when you're old. And the, the other way around, things that are good for you when you're old are not good for you when you're young. You know, growth hormone is very good for you when you're young. It's always better. You're protected from mortality, from diseases. And it switches when you're old. It happens actually that metformin lowers IGF-1, one of the growth hormones. Okay, why would a young person who's exercising take, take metformin? Metformin also lowers testosterone in some of the male, not every one of the male. So uh, metformin is a drug, and I, I think you're saying it right. Metformin is a drug that needs to have indication. There's also side effects to metformin that makes it you know, not relevant for some patients. So I agree that what we have to do now is to find the right kind of person to uh, to give metformin. And I agree that probably for metformin, you don't want to do it before maybe the age of 60 and 65. You don't know, want to do it for people who doesn't have hemoglobin A1C in the pre-diabetic range or that has insulin resistance or abdominal obesity. Uh, there's a question of male for female in some of those drugs. I don't. I don't think it's it's much. There's effects on liver disease or kidney diseases. So I agree that metformin for now shouldn't be indicated to anyone. And by the way, it's the same for the TAIN trial. We're not taking people who can be centenarians on their own. They have to have something that shows us that they're aging. They could be slow walker. Okay or they ha already had another age-related diseases, okay? So I, I think I agree totally that this is not everybody over the age of 50 on metformin, but the point is that aging has such a promise that we cannot wait, <laughs> you know, we can, we can start having at least a guideline of where we think physicians who can, you know, physicians can repurpose any drug, Okay, for physician, it's not an issue to to do to to write metformin. Okay, you can look at guidelines and stuff like that. But if if there's a lot of doctors I know that they take metformin, and if the patients say I want to be in metformin, they put them on metformin. It's not illegal. Okay, in this case, so I think I think there's a room to progress, and I agree that it's not everyone should get metformin. Because on on that point, and because viewers of this um, of this episode might be wondering why I'm um, not not skeptical, but I, I just want to wait for the evidence. Is that as you've already touched on, there are some people where metformin lowers testosterone levels. There's some research to suggest that actually metformin seems to blunt the positive effects of exercise. So that that's why I'm hesitant um, a, a, about prescribing metformin to, to everyone. And I think as you've rightly pointed out, you know, people probably before the age of, you know, 50 or 60 um, shouldn't be on metformin unless there's a particular reason to. But then I, I'm interested to see, again, what your TAME trial study results show um, for, for people that have, that seem to have age-related um, diseases such as, yeah, slow walking or whatever it may be. So once again, <laughs> I hope your study gets funded and I think it's a really important study to do. Right, and and I, I I agree with all your comments. So, uh, uh, Brad. Uh, so after all this this conversation, I hope uh, it was useful for you too. Uh, what uh, can be your final considerations about about uh, the the team trial and metformin? I think if anyone wanted to make a difference in this world and they've got the resources to do it, but they're not too sure where to put those resources, I think the team trial would be a, a great um, project to put your money towards. And Nir, uh, what do you do you think can be your final considerations? First of all, th thank you, Brad. And I'm I'm looking forward for us having more conversations, maybe in another in another uh, <laughs> uh, broadcast too. Uh, but I I think the the one thing if I if I wanted to highlight something that I said there, it has to be the example of the protection against COVID or flu, actually. There's evidence that metformin protects from flu because what I'm trying to do is the, most of the people who, who use metformin are diabetologists or, you know, they're the primary practitioner like, like Brett, but he's a unique, <laughs> he's a unique guy, okay? 
And, and diabetologists don't know about aging. Okay, that's what happened to me. I came, I, I thought I'll be endocrinologist and I'll know about aging and I know more, but not so relevant. So for me, aging, met diabetes, metabolism is part-time. There's autophagy, there's senescent, there's lots of other things. And one of them is the decline in immunity. And so if you have a drug that is anti-aging, that is gerotherapeutic, it will target the other hallmarks of aging. That's what's so cool about those hallmarks. They all interact with each other. When you take an old cell or an old uh, organ or an old body and make it young again, you fix a lot of things. And I think you should remember this example because I'm saying, forget diabetes now, you know? Metformin, yeah, it's for diabetes, but it's also against aging. And the proof of that is that People without diabetes take metformin and get a 50% decrease in a terrible, you know, a, a, a disease that had terrible outcomes because this is what metformin is doing, not only metabolism. So that, that's why I'm looking at things from an aging perspective and not from a metabolic perspective. Okay, I would like to, to thank uh, Nir Barzilai and Brad Stanfield uh, for this uh, great conversation. I'm completely sure that... <laughs> Anybody that uh, it's interesting in metforming or in TAME trial will find this conversation very, very useful. And that is the, the aim of this, of this uh, conversation. So thank you very much, Nir. Thank you. And thank you very much, Brad. Thank you.